how do you make comics without all the frustration, without feeling lousy and inadequate all the time? Join me, Jess Rolofson, and me, Tom Hart, on The Terrible Anvil. Each week, we build community and shift our mindset about what it means to make comics and art. We're working through the whole process, one piece at a time, turning our suffering and angst into fun and glee. Join us at sawcomics.org. Yay! Guess what time it is? It's terrible anvil time once more. This week, we're, it's episode 11, I think. <laughs> I'm starting to lose count, so that's a good sign. Uh, this episode is being broadcast virtually from the Sequential Artist Workshop. I'm your host, Jess Rulifson, and my lovely co-host is Tom Hart. He's also here in the void. <laughs> and uh, this is being streamed on YouTube, but we're not monitoring the chat. And uh, this is also a live call on Zoom. So our friends from Saw are here uh, kind of diving in and adding comments here and there, helping us out. So thanks for being here. And this is also available as a podcast. It is actually a podcast. <laughs> so we may also be listening to it uh, in the future. So hello from the past. I hope you're doing great. Um, and this episode, if I haven't said it already, we're talking about backgrounds, which uh, you could also call environments or locations, but where your story occurs in your comic. We have some brass tacks info for you on how to make backgrounds when you don't want to. Or maybe you're super into backgrounds and they take a lot of time. So we can also talk about that. And someone on the network, I forget who, might have been Joe, mentioned burnout. If we if we have time, we might talk about that. Depends on how freewheeling we are. But if we don't, I think it would tie in nicely to the next episode. So that's a teaser <laughs> for, for the next one. But let's do this one first, one at a time, single file. Tom, how do you draw backgrounds in comics? <laughs> go <laughs> as i get older and i'm finally old enough to realize i don't have to answer every question that somebody asks me i can answer my own damn question yay oh, yeah okay. just have a monologue insert tom monologue right. here. no answer yeah. that's, that's exactly right. what politicians do by the way so I, I i would vote for you for mayor exactly. of everything so i'm not going to answer that question i'm going to yeah. answer but i am but i will excitedly say that like last episode was super good it was really exciting to talk about expectations for so long but it was very um, it was vague and in the clouds for the whole episode because it was so internal and it was so psychological, you know. Now, as you said, brass tacks, backgrounds. I know I hate backgrounds. I know most people hate backgrounds. So this is going to, this is something I can get my teeth into. <laughs> this is also hysterical to me that I'm uh, joining the call from a white void and Tom is in front of a gorgeous piece of wood. So we're talking about backgrounds and we don't have any. Uh, it's anyway. the first time. And again, this is an audio podcast, but I will describe that Jess is utterly, her background is utterly blank. It is white with shades of gray behind her. And mine is like a light paneling. Um, and that's purposeful. Usually I have my fake background with like this jungle scene, this Victorian garden actually, or I have prints behind me or something, but that's intentional. I tried to get it as blank as possible, but still there's a little bit of texture there. And it's worth pointing out, right? There's there's a different psychological effect from I, both of these things. I might have migraine brain, but uh, I'm also <laughs> wearing black and Tom is wearing his really fabulous kind of uh, Western style shirt. <laughs> I feel like I'm describing a joke or a menu item. This is not translated very well into audio, but uh, black sort of uh, panels on the shoulders and then a really great check print. And we're appearing in my screen. I'm on the left and Tom is on the right. And I'm like, are, is this a comic right now? We have a two panel comic and we're in black and white and there are no backgrounds. So maybe we should do a screenshot and have everyone draw backgrounds for us. That would be a great exercise. Two panel. We're not here to do exercises. We're here right. to change mindsets. and We had to change the world, Tom. So, and okay, so you're excited about brass tacks. Do you, and I, I'm putting you on the spot if you don't want to answer how you tackle backgrounds or or maybe a better question is when you started cartooning how did you approach backgrounds and has that changed in how you relate to them now am I being interviewed I mean fine I don't know <laughs> that question I and again you know I I was raised primarily on like Garfield and Charlie Brown and and the really 
minimal comic strips from the 70s and 80s. Um, even Bloom County didn't have a lot of backgrounds. Um, and it's funny because Pogo, which is a very, very, very rich comic strip, and Peanuts overlapped by a few years. And Pogo is the most, is like the richest things have ever gotten. Um, the only thing that comes close in modern times is, is Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes, but because of space considerations, it never got as rich as far as backgrounds go. Um, so I trained myself to draw little cartoon characters and I trained myself to draw little emotional expressions. And I, and I was interested, like I think Schultz was interested, I was interested in the, in the dynamics of the people. And I was interested in like who was hurt by whom, <laughs> you know? And, um, and as such, I didn't really draw many backgrounds. When I think about Peanuts, and I think who was hurt by whom, I think there's another great setup that, that sort of goes ignored, but that's Sally, the uh, Charlie Brown's sister, was always furious at the school, like in general, she was furious at the school and she would sometimes stand by the side of the school and kick it. <laughs> so, Char so Charles Schultz would draw just like one line and some bricks and then Sally kicking it, right? So that was a quote background or an environment that, that was one of the few that you might see in, in a peanut strip. Um, so anyway, I, I was I tr I was trained or happy at least to not draw backgrounds for a very very long time. We got we got sort of razzed in, in the illustration department. Uh, if if you just if you quote unquote just had a character floating in space or a head, God forbid, a beautiful portrait, but it's it's just a head floating in space. Uh, what is it doing? It's it's not really providing a lot. Of, there's there's not enough context to create something that feels illustrative or uh, narrative driven, which illustration often is. So um, I, I was drawn to no pun intended. Um, making images of people somewhat realistically. I love I've always loved portraiture. So I was interested in that. So I, I did that and then I was like, oh, I guess I should have something behind them. So there's always like a, and then in figure drawing class, there's always just some towel pinned to the wall or like a thrift store, uh, you know, tapestry or something. So uh, it wasn't, I, I don't even think I was thinking about it very deeply until I got to doing, uh, maybe I was trying to find a way to do more commercial illustration and I wasn't too successful with that broadly speaking, as a student. Um, but then when I got into comics, it seemed like backgrounds were really um, like a gateway to more story. It seemed it's, it was somehow more interesting to me to try to make a background across a comics page than a one-shot illustration, because I think there are rules, or at least that's how I felt about, oh, I have to get the perspective right, and I, I want to make sure that the figure is the right proportions. And I felt like I could just get away with less literal drawing in comics, even though my backgrounds became more detailed. Uh, and when I first started making comics, my backgrounds were like hyper detailed. If there was a tree, I drew every single leaf on it. I was, it was like gilded and really, really delightful. And, um, and then I think I realized it was harder to read that way. Like it was not always necessary. I didn't realize you could have a push and a pull. And it, when I started reading more comics, I was like, oh, I don't have to do this all the time. But if I want to, or when it seems appropriate, when would be the best time to do this in this story that had a little bit more context? Sometimes that's an establishing shot. If a scene changes or a new character shows up or character leaves, you can zoom out a little bit, show where people are. Um, the time of day shifts. If it was like a time warp <laughs> or a flashback, it's always good to just zoom out a little bit and show a little bit more of the space you're thinking of. But then once you have that, I don't, I feel like Sometimes you don't even need to include that if the words on the page say, meanwhile, at uh, Spaceship 10, if you have like a, uh, I don't know, like a steering wheel for a spaceship, we're in a spaceship and not a car because they said so. Uh, so sometimes the drawing can be informed by the words on the page too, and it doesn't have to be super elaborate. But I've noticed establishing shots are really, really helpful for guiding the flow of the narrative. So I want to I want to link a little bit. It's sort of just a coincidence, but I want to link last week's expectations with this week's backgrounds. What are we, what expectations are we living with when we start out and dive in and think, oh, I got to draw backgrounds? And I'm going to- It gonna... depends on the story. That's a great question. Um, what are you thinking? Well, I think, and you can tell me what you think. I think we are 
um, sort of naturally believe that we have to make our story immersive. And by immersive, I mean we have to make it look and feel like it's real, and we have to look, make it make it look and feel like the the reader is inside the story. And mm -hmm. I actually totally agree that that's an awesome thing. However, it's not the only thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, so more often than not, I think I think our expectation is that's how you that's how you do a comic. You do a comic by making the background as full as possible and making the characters detailed so that we believe we're in that story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people maybe mentally interchange immersive and realistic when you can make a comic very immersive without it being realistic at all. Like manga is very emotionally immersive and a lot of times it's like close-ups of heads and there's like shapes behind the characters and there's not backgrounds for several pages and it's it's totally immersive as an example. Um, when I was working on nonfiction stuff, particularly if it's short form and I feel like there's less time to explain and there's um, scene changes and all these places are based on real places I feel like there was a need to make sure I was getting some of the details right um, but not always a guarantee I mean most of my primary source material is google images unfortunately because <laughs> I, I like you know can't fly to a, a foreign country or go back in time to what it might look, have looked like I'm glad we live in an era of image search that's really at our fingertips now more than ever and then also um, there's a lot of like good photographers out there. It is getting a little dicier <laughs> with uh, AI. If you're like this, I'm looking for a specific location and a specific object and um, kind of have to know what you're looking for. Um, so th I think the re the expectations when working on uh, nonfiction stuff, if I want to establish a real place that's based on the, the writing that's been given to me, I want to make sure uh, it's real if that if that's part of the story that it's in it's intentional and the specific location is named um on the other hand uh like when we're doing the comics for the boston globe that are set at the hospital i don't necessarily want to disclose which hospital uh to just keep things a little more private so i need it to look like a hospital which feels more like improv theater where i'm like oh if we have a curtain and a gurney <laughs> we're at the hospital which uh, and then you just find all these really cool angles of like the same two objects or or um, IV pumps. There's there's like props basically. So then the backgrounds become more pop prop driven, which I, I think is um, interesting. Like the objects become charged with narrative themselves. Um, I, they become more interesting to draw to because I'm like, oh, it's it's this particular thing, even though I'm kind of making it up. Objects charged with narrative is a great thread I want to follow, um, but not yet. I want to ask you more about when you were starting out. I know one of the early comics I can think of, and I think this is what you're talking about when you said you would draw every leaf on every tree, is there, uh, you did a a veteran story of a um, veteran in, in uh, Mississippi where you grew up. And um, am I right? And so you did, you drew all the, there was like this party scene and there was the outdoor scene and you did draw every tree and every, um and all the leaves and and since I know that foliage at least I know you know southern Florida and stuff like that like I really felt that story and I really felt um the environment there um and then you redrew it and you drew it less uh less detailed and so why did you make those decisions yeah that's a, that's a good question yeah so when you're talking about, oh, there was like some level of recognition, I, I'm really happy to hear that. I don't think that was an intention, but that can be cool. Like I'm from the deep South. So maybe there was a subconscious love letter to that location because I don't see it often in comics or television very accurately portrayed. Like uh, things can be like Hollywood can just shoot something in Arkansas and say it's Florida, for example. And no one totally knows the difference unless you're from that area and you're like, this doesn't look right. And then you kind of look it up and you're like, oh, it's actually this other thing. Um, and they're not that different, but um, if, you, if you're leaving kind of a breadcrumb trail for mm -hmm. specific readers, that's cool. And I don't know if I was intentionally doing that, but I'm happy to hear it was uh, like a moment of recognition. On the other hand, um, I redrew the things, not because I'm uh, a glutton for punishment, it was like I had done a lot of different pieces across time and my style was kind of changing, um, not intentionally, but I, I did notice just based on the deadlines of certain pieces that were being um, 
like excerpted and, and put into different magazines and newspapers that my my style would change against the terrible anvil of the deadline. So if I if it's just up to me and I'm making a zine, I'll draw all the leaves on all the trees. And then if there's a deadline, I'm like, let's get out of here. I get, it's got to be digital and then you got to do it really fast and it gets uh, soupier, I think. I still have detail, but it, it looks a little different. So, um, so in going to the book and trying to compile all these different pieces, I was like, I kind of have to have um, a visual thread where it kind of all looks the same. And each time, I think more importantly, each time something was getting excerpted, there are varying lengths and varying dimensions. Like here's a two page print comic and here's a 10 panel digital comic. And I wanted there to be a regimented length per chapter in the print graphic novel. So I was like, each chapter is going to be 12 pages. It's just what I chose that sounded manageable. And then I had to work around that. So some of it involved redrawing it, but sometimes I would just copy what, you know, the content of the image was still good. But then I had an opportunity to decide, well, how detailed do I want to be? <laughs> or how much longer do I want to spend <laughs> drawing this graphic novel? So sometimes that translated into a simplified um, sort of drawing style, I guess, or, or yeah, drawing less. <laughs> And and as such, maybe maybe the readers were less immersed in the locale, right? But yes. hopefully, because of the length of the graphic novel and the and the, the totality of it, and the linking psychology of all of the interviews, hopefully they were immersed in um, the overlapping stories and the cyclical stories, right? Yes, and there's something that's universal, and also there were places that I had never been to, like, like Iraq and Afghanistan, that I was relying on photos, and I was like, well, Afghanistan has big mountains, and Iraq is very flat, and I could just draw a straight line for that, and we're in the desert, uh, so so there became like a shorthand for the different places, but each of the veterans, at least a portion of each of those stories, each of those chapters, was set at in a particular town or city in America and those all felt like slightly different I am interested in American regionalism and I like stuff looking a little bit different and and um I don't know that felt interesting to me and it was enough I think I wanted it to be different and specific uh but still stylized so that it'd be easy to draw I could get it done but specific enough where that people knew I wasn't phoning it in on like their favorite place on earth. I don't know because of how I feel about how, where I'm from is visible or invisible in visual narratives or otherwise. So um, do you remember the McLeod book, the making comics? It was the sequel to understanding comics or it was the second sequel to understanding comics. But anyway, he talks about um, uh, in drawing environments, actually, he, he talks about comics as being able to engage all the senses, right, and, mm -hmm. and smell and taste and things like that. But um, uh, there's this one panel where he, you know, he goes out of his way. McLeod always does everything a little bit over the top, right? So, so he goes out of his way to show you that it is a silent panel, but it's not silent because it is so full of visual detail. And and you can almost feel like the grasshoppers and you know everything kind of like because it's this uh, it's this grassy grassy scene under a tree and there's a soccer ball and things and and McLeod because he is he's such a performer he like he he caps his ballpoint pen or whatever and it just to show you that there's no speaking in this panel but but it's but that's the that's the moment in where he's showing you that comics can be immersive and they can completely envelop you in your in all your senses um and again i, I think that is absolutely one one thing that can be done but i i do think it's a i do think it's a sort of um default that a lot of people go to and then they get frustrated when they can't hit it because i couldn't have drawn every blade of grass in that even that single panel that mcleod did or yeah. or every leaf that you draw um, and I'm always trying to balance, like, the funny thing is, is, like, I said, I hate backgrounds, but given, left to my own devices these days, anyway, it's always changing, but these days, like, the past year, year and a half, mostly all, all I want to draw is rocks and trees, like, I don't even want to draw characters, <laughs> but, but I'm struggling every time I draw a tree with, like, how do you really draw a tree and not draw every leaf? Like, I just don't mm -hmm. know, and I yeah, just... And Hmm, I don't know. I mean, maybe you don't. Maybe maybe it's one or the other or something in between. Um, the questions I have when I'm when I'm drawing, I feel like every panel is a decision, which is probably why it's difficult to make comics. Right. I don't know. 
if you're indecisive, which I find a lot of cartoonists and artists are like, ah, should it be this or that? Most of the readers are like, just keep going. This as long as it's legible and it makes sense, you kind of get right. to decide how, how you want it to sound, how you want your comics to sound, the visual sound of your page. That's really cool. Um, especially since we're talking about comics on a podcast, the visual sound. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think when I uh, lay out a comics page and I'm, I'm going and I get all the info in there like okay it has to be this person and you know it's that person because they're wearing a black t-shirt or I gotta make sure they always have their glasses on so we don't get lost and and make sure where the camera is isn't confusing and so I have all that I have my caption boxes and my word balloons it, it's not secondary I mean uh, someone pointed out on the network that backgrounds should really be called environments and not something that is um a secondary thought, the way that we often think about lettering, <laughs> where we're like, I'll do that later. And then we're like, oh, this is a mess. So you're kind of thinking about everything all at once. When I'm doing that, I'm looking at the comics page. I'm having fun um, asking each panel, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, what are you doing? What would you like to do? Or like, since you're the first panel and it's a new scene, what do you need to do? Or like, oh, this is the middle panel where someone starts yelling. Or, oh, this is the last panel right before sunsets for example like there's always some type of action that i know that's coming before during or after that panel what do i want to emphasize um so it feels like i've only played a limited amount of music but it feels like um playing by ear in a funny way like listening to what the uh, the page is presenting once you have all the details that you're like okay i have to have these things then you make your sort of creative decisions at least that's how i work otherwise i get a little too um maybe I start to um second guess a little bit more or or my confidence crashes but if I have everything that I think I need there that gives me some kind of sense of like well I, at least the, I have everything that's supposed to be there there <laughs> so I know I can't go wrong or I have some type of parameters which I parameters are really really useful I remember when I discovered the silhouette as and as a young oh. yes <laughs> <laughs> the best. Tom also had a funny joke. It's the inverse of a silhouette, but they're like, if you can't draw backgrounds, uh, just have everything happen in the dark or in a snowstorm because it's just solid black or solid white. But the silhouette is great if you're like, I don't love drawing people, but what if they were shadows? But it, but they taught me an important thing when I realized, and now we're not talking about backgrounds, we're talking about people, but it taught me an important thing, which is that we don't I think, and I think this is is building on what you were saying, where you ask every panel what it wants to be. Like, um, we don't need to draw, we don't need to see everything every panel. Like, I, I didn't realize that. Like, like you can just like, sort of remind us of of who's speaking and where they are with just these little marks that are silhouettes, you know. Or there's any number of ways. And manga and manga has taught us so much. At least taught me so much by getting by eliminating so much like Tezuka and other other people in manga they'll get rid of whole bodies they'll be just like a literally a floating head um half of a head sometimes they'll get away with like this just like letting everything else fade away because it's important um again we're not talking about backgrounds but since you mentioned snowstorm I've got a couple examples I wanted to pull up and I, it's, it's a podcast so I'm just going to describe the artwork but I'll put the links in the chat and I'll put the links on the home page but um uh one thing is john burns alpha flight number six or five or something like that from marvel comics 1983 or four or something and he's not the first person or only person to do this but it's a famous example where he had like a fight scene and it's like four or five pages in a snowstorm and it it, it like pissed off some people and everybody else thought it was just like the funniest thing and um and it's great i'll put it up again i'll put that in the chat but but i think that john Byrne. I think I think John Byrne, even though is a very traditional artist, I think he's also kind of a prankster. And I think he was like seeing how much he could push it and remind very mainstream readers and mostly very young mainstream readers at that point. They're probably a mixture of teens and well, probably old guys too. <laughs> even then. Um, teens at heart. <laughs> yeah. But pushing it and saying and like and forcing them to engage with the idea that they're still reading a comic, even though there are no pictures and only words. And right, so it's this fight scene with, with captions and dialogue, but it's like four or five panels of is just white with the, with the words. And, um, and I just think that's a really great 
avant-garde thing to have tried in a Marvel comic. Um, and the great thing is how he pulls you out of it at the last panels with like this enormous rock slide. Um, and then, and, and you, and he draws every single rock after that. And there's just like this big avalanche uh, from under the snow. And after that, it's, it's a really, it's a really beautiful panel or two of, of whoever the main character is coming out of the rock slide. Um, so he's trying, so he gives you a little bit of both, right? He gives you like, I'm not going to draw anything for four pages, but then I'm going to knock you out with a, with a rock slide. Um, and uh, it was a great early mainstream example of trying to show people of what their, um, what their assumptions were when they read a comic. It's like, how come I can't see the punching? You know, how come I can't see the flying? And the, you know, why am I only reading words? What is this thing? You know, <laughs> but, but it trained some people back then to, to realize like, oh, you know, if my brain is engaged, if I'm, um, you know, if I'm immersed in the story and I can believe it just from what I'm hearing, which I'm not hearing anything at all, I'm seeing words on a page, I, it's still believable and I'm still excited, you know, even though I'm angry that there's no pictures or whatever. So anyway, that's a great example. And hopefully it disrupted things or even just thinking about it now, if you've never seen it, hopefully it disrupts some people's assumptions that you have to draw. A, you know, a typical realistic thing in every panel and you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stumped you no I didn't mean to stump you but uh well, I, mean, I, had all, I had all these great thoughts and then like when you stopped speaking it was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like uh, well I mean it's a good, good segue to what you were saying which is like you're setting up um in the um in the hospital so then from a blank from a snowstorm right we're from a blank stage like you said like it's a, like a, like it's I think you said it's like a theater you can build up what are the props we need to establish that it's a hospital right and again I would ask what is the purpose of this comic and I think to some degree it's to show the anxiety of being in a hospital the number of decisions that have to happen um and so you probably can get away with props. I love that you said that they're charged with narrative, right? So these props that are charged with narrative, you probably get to the important ones that have something to do with a decision, that have to do with keeping um, keeping the patients in a certain state. But you don't need every wire, you don't need every outlet, you don't need every TV and old food container, unless, unless it's a different comic. But in your comic, you've chosen the props that you need, and you just move them around. And we believe there hopefully because you keep the anxiety up if anxiety is the main the main story goal or just um whatever narrative you're trying you're you're conveying you keep it up um with the minimal of detail that you need mm -hmm. yeah and I, I think it in a funny way um having an entire comic set in the same place these, these are self-contained vignettes that we'd like to collect into a graphic novel length work but um, I think we're on the third or the fourth piece. We've written, uh, I say we, but my, my husband has written the third and the fourth piece. He, he wrote the fourth piece before the third. And then we suddenly realized, oh, we have to go back. And there's this sort of middle part. But um, the piece before last that he wrote had us outside of the hospital for the first time oh. and us interacting outside of his work. And that was something interesting that like, I don't know if he planned or we had never talked about that that's where we wanted the narrative to go. We we're just like, just write a bunch of stuff. You have so many good stories. Everyone has crazy stories from work, no matter what job you have. You're like, oh, this guy came in today. I have to tell you about them. Or, oh, I saw this person today on the sidewalk, even going like commuting to work. If if you're commuting, <laughs> maybe you're like me and Tom and you work from home a lot. And you're like, guess what my cat did? But uh, <laughs> yeah, there's these like little narrative moments that like, oh, if we collect all these together, maybe it will tell us something. So that was interesting that, we started to exist outside of the hospital. And I think one of the early pieces we did, I have my husband walking into the hospital at the beginning of the shift and leaving the hospital. And the time of day has shifted because it was important for me to describe this person has been indoors all day. And the shift is 12 hours, not eight that we're accustomed to in the Western world, usually being an eight hour shift. 12 hours is a really long time to keep a lot of different people alive and do a lot of different things. And 
um it's uh it would it would be a long that'd be a long bus ride a long movie <laughs> martin scort says he's not yet given us a 12 hour masterpiece as far as i know you know if we get a piece of art like that we have to digest it as a mini series for example so I, I i was interested in the time um and then the backgrounds were like almost silly i always had to have a window or something with like the clouds going by so you could tell what time of day it is because the hospital is famous if you've been there uh, either as a patient or someone working there, you don't exactly know what day it is or what time of day it is, even though everything is methodically charted a lot of times as like a neurological test. So it's like, do you know where you are? We're in a hospital. Do you know what time it is or what day it is? Uh, even like the doctors have to check their phones because they're like, what day is it? Because they're like, I don't know. Um, I, I saw a funny wall clock the other day that is a, it's a, days of the week clock and actually runs where you know what day it is that I really would love to get to like for them to hang up in the hospital in the break room or something um yeah so maybe the backgrounds also tell us a little bit about time to like where we are but maybe also when we are like how 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 long like the um the example you just shared with the snowstorm it's a big fight scene and it takes it, it takes like four pages, which is like, I feel like a long time in comics hours, uh, at least in the man, man hours it would take to draw that, right? Like, so there's something about it that seems significant. If it, if it takes up more space on the page, the panels, like then we're like, he's I not mean, drawing anything. He's still not drawing anything. Like there's some, there's, I get where the outrage comes from that you're like, oh, so many panels with just the words, which feels like a big rip off. Cause you're like comics are words and pictures. I think there was a, a, a sort of uproar and some of the kids wanted to know, like, was he paid for those pages? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say the sound effects are absolutely beautiful. Like he drew the pants right off of those. <laughs> oh, that's the letter or the letter would have done that. Oh, really? Even the sound effects? Yeah, 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 totally. totally. Well, shout out to the letter on that one. They were working overtime. <laughs> um, I want to talk about another example. And then I see that Carol's asking about Crazy Cat in the in the chat. That's super interesting too. But I wanted to talk about, and again, the link I put in the chat is for um is in the Saw Comics flow group and it is to some some pre-materials we put up there, but we'll we'll make sure they're on the on the page on the Substack and and maybe even clip some into the video. But I wanted to talk about um some Edward Edward Gorey pieces I was looking at. I don't know if you had a chance to look at them yet, Jess. Yeah, Tom includes like a uh, uh, maximalist and minimalist from the same artist, Edward Gorey, who's yeah. for the children book illustration. Yeah, yeah. One is called, um, uh, oh, suddenly I've forgotten. It is the, the obelisk. Yeah, the Chinese obelisks. And um, in that one, it, it's an a, a, a through Z story. So it's 26 panels. The first panel is, is an A is for something, B is for something. A is for the author who went on a walk. And uh, this author is pretty much walking in this pretty vacant landscape. Um, you, you see a line for a building, you see a line for a sidewalk sometimes. Every once in a while he'll draw a, uh, um, a street light, you know, because Gorey really liked the shapes of Victorian uh, things like that. And so you'll, you'll see a street light or something like that. But mostly it's white space with some lines. And it's funny because um, uh, in Amphigory 2, the book that I have that collects this, it also has his draft of this of this book, which he doesn't, which they don't do much. I don't know why they did it for this particular story, but it's like clearly a draft done in pen very, very, very quickly. And so F, if I remember correctly, F is for a fire in a second floor apartment or something like that. And, um, and in the draft, you get one line for the apartment building that sort of starts in the middle of the page and then goes to the top, right? So that so it's a vertical line indicating that it's a building. And then you get a little Very squid. similar to the uh, building that Sally was kicking from Peanuts. If yeah. you have a vertical line, you can kick it. <laughs> right, right, right. And then, and then a square for I think it might have been two squares for a window and flames coming out of the and flames coming out of the out of the squares. That's in the squiggly pen drawing. In the final. He got rid of the line and he got rid of the squares. And it's just the author looking up at two floating flames in the sky. And it says F is for the fire on the second floor window or whatever. It's amazing. Mm. 
you know, that he chose to remove everything. And so suddenly all you're getting is character and fire. And like the whole story is is pretty much filled with, if not anxiety, certainly like ennui, which is all, all of it. But, <laughs> but like, so this walk is like filled with ennui and like, he, and you get to F, which is only like what, six, six panels in or something. And it's just like a fire in the sky that he mm -hmm. didn't even want to, that he just thought it was more important to not show the building and just show the fire. And it's just such a great choice that was clearly conscious because the script, the first draft had, had the line in there. I, I think it's in an earlier Anvil episode. I, I feel like I'm always bragging about how lazy I am, which I really <laughs> shouldn't do. But uh, I think sometimes uh, really cool ideas in comics where like, oh, that's so cool almost feel like cheating where you're like oh man John Byrne just drew nothing that's a cheat or like oh man Edward Gorey just drew these flames in the sky but uh because the caption says like oh here comes the snowstorm da, da, da. like I think the the work that the words are doing are like efforts for fire on the second floor and then we believe you and then on top of that there's this intensity because the words did the work the picture can really like take a shirt off and have a crazy time like there's just the the flames and just the person responding or not to to the to the moment and uh, it feels like this uh real specific thing that's like you can have hyper specificity and hyper uh like heightened emotion without any kind of like super duper rendering um, but you can if you want if you want to render all your leaves you have a great time oh. plenty of people do it um uh, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking of uh, what are some crazy ones? Habibi by um, what's that guy's name? Craig Thompson. He draws yeah, Craig Thompson. everything. He's yeah. Craig's in a class by himself. I want to, if you don't mind, I want to keep talking about Gory. Two reasons that that story. Um, what did they say it was called? The Chinese obelisks. That story from A to Z. First of all, every panel, the author is in this really rich um fur coat and the fur coat is rendered with like three thousand little lines you know so i've mentioned that there's like no lines in the background and you know one line for a for a sidewalk or something but every fur coat every every panel probably took an hour and a half to draw and probably 75 percent of that was fur coat and and so that's interesting right so you really get i think invested in just watching this character move slowly in his fur coat throughout the story. But what's interesting to me is I think, I'm trying to think S, maybe A, B, C, D, you know. Anyway, somewhere towards S or T, there's cloud cover. And um, and it says like something, the, the clouds, uh, the, oh, S is for the sun, which went behind the clouds, that's it. And then suddenly it's gray. Every, there's, it's not white anymore, it's, but it's light gray by T. I think there's a thunderclap and it's really dark. And so all the darkness is rendered with lines and lines and suddenly things are getting a little more oppressive, right? And it's kind of a background. It's mostly just gray, but it's rendered in little lines, kind of similar to the lines of the, of the, um, of the fur coat. And then, <laughs> and then you is this giant urn that falls from the sky. And then V it, it, comes it basically it kills our our main character in in v or w v and that panel is like the character in the urn like in real space on the page about an inch away from it but it's a giant urn the background is really dark gray and you realize this character is about to get uh, killed by this <laughs> giant urn from the sky and then w they take him away on a wagon and the gray and the gray lightens up a little bit, and so you realize if you look at it, and and I I did post this in the chat, and we'll post it on the on the homepage. Um, if you look at it as a poster, and you can, it's white, 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 all the way until the death scene, which goes light gray, dark gray, light gray, and then it empties out in, in white again. And it's um it's just a it's just a really masterful control of the the effect that the background is having on the story. It's so great. It's so great. Yes, and it reminds me of what I said earlier about like the choices you make within one panel might be informed with how you approach the previous or the the panels that come after. And also, uh, I always talk about art budgeting. Like, mm. if you don't render every single panel because that's a choice, because maybe you're like me and you're a little lean on the lazy side of the thing, um, what moment do you really want to like have your fur coat Edward 
gory moment and what moment is the flames and nothing else uh, <laughs> and uh, and why are those moments the ones you choose and and it's almost like hitting a particular note and and kind of becoming a composer of the work and um I, I found out like it's actually not lazy because it, it was like very intellectually stimulating to try to make particular choices that support the whole page mm -hmm. um I always out, accidentally outsmart myself. I'm like, I'm going to be lazy. I'm like, oh, that's actually really cool. <laughs> I think that worked. A big example I always use from my work, I, it didn't end up in the graphic novel, but I met a veteran at Walter Reed a Hospital uh, that I had really drawn very specifically in his uh, hospital room talking about being shot. Uh, he was shot in Afghanistan. He, he convalesced very briefly in Germany, and then he came back to D.C. where we met him at the military hospital. And um, the the circumstances around him being shot were like complicated and that he was lying on his belly um and also the uh entry point of the bullet uh it like kind of went in through his back and then left out of his shoulder so I was like first of all that sounds gross and scary second of all like how am I gonna draw like a human anatomy like it's gonna it's gonna be too all this sounds too difficult so I had uh I think I had been looking at City of Glass the David Mazzucchelli adaptation by the Paul Auster novel and Paul Karasik also the layouts for that um so some of those things that some of those moments are, are really abstracted and I was like how about I just draw a circle across three panels that gets bigger and bigger because that was the way uh, that was describing he was like something was wrong and then I realized this there was this kind of like need to slow down time I was like perfect <laughs> and then when I colored it like I think I was using like a lavender and then the it, it kind of turns into a dark uh purple but it's uh it's it's sort of but it doesn't look like a bullet hole it's so abstract I it doesn't look like blood it doesn't look like anything that was scary to me but it was like exceedingly powerful and I was like nailed it I'm amazing <laughs> I win at cartooning uh, because I was being avoidant so it's funny what you run from you end up maybe not always but sometimes you land on a um maybe a less literal uh solution could be more exciting and then you can save the moments for when you really want to be literal if you want to yeah yeah that's great I, I yeah that that can tip over into i'm just gonna make everything abstract which wouldn't be a great idea either especially for stories that are so rooted in reality like war stories and and um uh stories of coming home and veterans and stuff but that's a that's a great solution and again i, I Oh, I was just going to say you could, you know, you could definitely pair that with waking up, at, you know, to the surroundings that are real, right? Because that that you've you've abstracted that pain and you've made that pain exist in its own reality, and then at some point you could show show our shared reality, and that would be more you know, that would be a powerful pairing. Mm -hmm. I or think not. there's also something. I mean, I thank God so far I have not been shot, <laughs> but there I've I've stubbed my toe. I've broken a small bone. Like I've had encounters with pain. Uh, I had I had a migraine yesterday. <laughs> not to brag, but like we've all encountered some level of pain, right? Uh, childbirth, all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, uh, stubbing my toe, I say, sort of funny, but it is even a small injury, a paper cut, like time stops briefly for me while I like whine about, oh no, or like, how bad is it? Like, uh, is there gonna, is that's gonna leave a mark as the famous Chris Farley um, quote. Uh, so so I've, I felt okay with slowing time, time down. I was like, I've never been shot, but I've hurt myself before. And this is what it feels like to me. So I was like, maybe other people feel that way too. Pain, um, am I right, Tom? <laughs> Drawing pain. How do you draw pain? Right, that'll be another another episode. Um, did we did we talk enough about about setting and props? Excuse me, and um, and just how to how to know what the right amount is. Do you think we covered that? As we, we could certainly, we could down? certainly, yeah, we're winding down. I think we could go a little bit more into that. I think we talked a little bit very briefly at the top of the call about when to draw backgrounds like why when it's useful on a literal sense if you're establishing a scene or something like that why to do them we, we sort of just covered that with like how how literal or abstract you want to be and other varying degrees of realism or uh, disclosing or withholding visual information mm. um, how to do it maybe um, is, is what we're thinking of uh, 
my recipe for the lazy cartoonist, if you have, and this is like a very bootleg version of Justine's depth and details class. So if you really want the real deal, go go get that class. So I think it's a it's an asynchronous class available on uh what's our website? So learn. <laughs> Learn.comics.org, <laughs> something like that. Uh, it's still up, right? Justine's depth and detail. It's part of the it's part of the year long program. Part of yeah. the year long program, so you just have to sign up for that, I guess. But um, anyhow, I think there are a couple of isolated um drawing tutorials from Justine on our YouTube as well, if I'm remembering that right. But um, if you have a background, which is the what we've been talking about, what's the furthest away in space? A horizontal or vertical line? Boom, we've got something. <laughs> But sometimes a vertical line, depending on how close it is to the character, could could be in a, any plane. But usually a horizontal line is very, very far away, let's say, um, either on the floor or like very far away in space. So that's a background. A mid-ground can be like maybe there's something behind the character, but a little bit closer. So that could be something that's going to appear to be smaller than the character if the, if the character is closest to us in this example. And then foreground can be like, let's say we have someone standing outside in a garden. Maybe the, the background is a, a tiny little fence that's far, far away. Um, I like putting stuff in the background that I don't know how to draw and silhouetting them like horses. If we're in the desert, I'll draw a really tiny horse really far, far away because if, if it gets any closer, they don't have to really figure out how to draw it. Uh, so, so put things you don't want to draw as far away as possible. That's a good dance move. Mid-ground, let's say if we're in the garden again, um, maybe there's a, a shrub or a tree, like a, a vertical, two vertical lines and some squiggles that looks like tree bark. And then your foreground might be like a delicate leaf or a frond of some kind that's or fern that's sort of leaping up from out of the camera frame. Um, and somewhere your 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 main character is having a great time potting a plant. <laughs> I don't know. But as a really quick example, so if you have something in the background, you have something in the midground, and the midground might even be your character or something, or the foreground. If you have each of those, even if you don't know a single thing about perspective or what time of day it is, it tends to give your panel a little more juice or a little more um, texture. So it's worth trying if you're like, there's nothing going on here. Can can you add one of those? And then you tend to have at least two out of three, and that's pretty good. Um, but you don't have to be hyper detailed with it necessarily. But I don't know. Do you have any like how how to draw background? And that might not be what you were asking, Tom. So I want to steer that. No, that, that's great. No, that's really good advice. And I I think um I think when I discovered that you could have a foreground element in front of your character, that was like really fun, and it made me realize like, oh, this does feel like there's space here, right? This does feel like I'm peering into a little world and that can be fun when you create that for a reader um what you just hit upon with like you know the, the fence and the and the horse and the plant and stuff is sometimes sometimes the idea of drawing backgrounds is so daunting but we don't realize that um if in our in our particular story we might just need to really get good at a few different things and and those few things will be will be most of our backgrounds for most of the story, right? So maybe that, you know, get really good at that chain link fence. I know you you weren't describing a chain link fence. I think you were describing- I have drawn one before and so has Don Unger and we both like lamented, why did I decide <laughs> to do that? His looks so good. And he, he drew it across several panels. I, I just added that on a splash page. I was like, the, I'm going ham as the kids say, and it's all about the chain link fence. And then after that, I, I started phoning it in. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't talk about how like a lot of manga artists will a use photographs and just like heighten the contrast and then and then suddenly it looks like it's a drawing except it doesn't it looks like it's a photograph and it doesn't matter and two borrow each other's backgrounds they do that all the time like in they're they're so brazen I love it um, because it's such a it's such a most Japanese uh, mainstream Japanese manga is a, such a bigger industry than anything we have here. Um, that the, the the project is to get it done, get it done, get it out the door, and have everybody read it by Wednesday or whatever. And so, and so they'll they they take shortcuts. We we call them shortcuts, but really they're just cuts. Yeah. <laughs> really, they're just dance moves, like you said. You yeah. know, dance moves work, and what dance moves help you. Um, and I think they made the choice, like, no, I'm not going to not put a background here, but I'm going to put a really fast background in here. Right. I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna swipe one, I'm gonna photograph one, I'm gonna use my part, my you know, my studio mate's background or whatever, just so you know, now we're in the city or now, you know, now we're 
up at a, in a penthouse apartment or now we're in a store or whatever those I think things there's also yeah. this like untapped humor and like memes that are like really like intentionally uh like slapped together that because there's a lot of visual shorthand in there it becomes even funnier um I don't think this was Mira Jacobs intention but she like often would recycle characters in good talk that were like main characters that had multiple pages of dialogue with with the other main character that are just background characters later in the story You're like wait isn't that that lady from that other chapter and then also same thing with the background so there was like this repetition uh, a lot of the dialogue was just laid on top of aerial photos of new york city uh, pre and post 9-11 and um, that was part of the narrative but it was also when you're looking at it you're like what is this this isn't it's not doing anything super splashy or fancy it's just like let's we need a background and this is what it is because that's how I'm approaching this kind of interesting which a lot of people I think people that literally I have to do it this way it has to be immersive when they saw that work they were like confronted with their own expectations and they were like that's not how you do it Totally, totally. I like what you just described is about creating a world, but also creating a language. And like, once you can get people trained to that language, they're really in, in with it for hopefully as long as you keep them engaged. And so like that language can be really fun. Like if suddenly background characters pop up as foreground or foreground characters pop up as background characters or buildings pop up where they shouldn't and stuff, because you've been trained to think of them a certain way, your engagement keeps getting tweaked by the author and that's terrific. And actually that's a great, I think it's a great segue to answer Carol's question. And Carol just said, can you talk about crazy cat backgrounds? And to me, that was also about like keeping you in this like slightly hyper, hyper dream state, like constantly aware that nothing is real, right? Because the background shift, because suddenly the moon is a triangle, you know, or, you know, what, what was a hill is now a flat plane or is now suddenly a giant box resting on a, resting on a circle. I mean, just because those backgrounds change constantly, you're always reminded that nothing's real here. here. And the playfulness, you get, you're sort of like, and then, then you're more okay and more, I think, more engaged with the playfulness of the language and playfulness of the, of the dynamics of the characters and whatever the hell's going on in all those, those decades of stories. That's what I was I trying to find a good example of crazy cat for the chat. So I just grabbed something from Wikipedia. If you're like, what is that? <laughs> just so you can see it looks like a beautiful, uh, like, a, I guess a newspaper strip, but it would often take up a full newspaper page. Big sagas, sort of like little Nemo, if you've seen Windsor McKinney's work. Oh, but that's different because he, he would draw everything in hyper detail and he was so competent at it that it was all perfect. Like perspective was perfect. He could draw elephants, you know, draw an he, elephant. He drew so, all these like, uh, like clock pieces in perspective, like on a yeah. um, on a table, just so a character could sneeze and all the stuff would went went I, everywhere. Right. So funny. right, not everybody would be up for that, right? Or not? Yeah, everybody... I just I, I meant it more as like a genre. Like if you if you've ever seen Little Nemo and you're like, because when I say a uh, newspaper strip, we think of like something abbreviated, but sometimes the newspaper strips from the turn of the century took up a whole newspaper page as one story versus um, one one tier of comics. Let's say, just nerd now, you know, nerd stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Did we did we wrap up on 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 backgrounds yeah I think we ended where you said nothing is real <laughs> so. well yeah you know I mean but again the, it's always like it always goes back to that question as to what is it for what is your background for what is your belief that you have to do backgrounds for and again to me it's like how do you like I don't think you get points for no one gets points for drawing great backgrounds they get points for engaging the reader and they get points for keeping the reader engaged and so if you do happen to draw the backgrounds and great and great everything, like you know, your Mobius or something, and you know, that will be that will be a way that you just you keep your readers um really excited. But you can also keep them engaged in a lot of other ways. And yes. Um, I also think what we're excited about, I have a feeling that Mobius drew everything all the time, always everything everywhere all at once, because he loved to do that. And so if you love to do something or find something delightful or strange or engaging, and it's, it's exciting for you to try to figure out on the page, 
you know, ups and downs. I'm not saying you're going to be thrilled 24 <laughs> seven. We could talk about our expectations on wanting to be yay art 24 seven. That's, that's a hard road to travel, but, uh, but if, if it tends to entertain you as a creator, very likely will invite an audience around that, that same campfire where they're like, oh my gosh, look, look at the way, what a cool idea or not. Maybe it's the other idea. Why did Tom do that? <laughs> Or yeah, or just like, I'm not reading any more of those comics, but yeah, you're drawing the line in the sand and that, you know, I, I don't know. That's cool. <laughs> All right. So what's, so we've talked about backgrounds last week. We talked about expectations. What are we talking yeah. about next week? I feel bad because Tom was like, finally, we could talk about some real stuff. And it's funny that we ended on like, well, you know, nothing's real, but <laughs> brass tacks. But uh, next week, we're going back into the ether, it feels like, in terms of like an idea. Uh, someone was asking about burnout. And so maybe that ties in a little bit. Uh, I, I was sort of thinking about this idea for the Bootlegger's Guide to Comics. It's I, I wrote, the call is coming from outside the house. The, the horror movie trope is, the call is coming from inside the house. So there's a startling realization on making work about the world by using what's inside of you, which also sounds like super corny. But I, I wanted to talk about um, what we already know, even if we're working in memoir or something, like how the world uh, can be the source of, of what we're uh, what using versus like, I think there's this idea that we are the well and we have to get everything from ourselves. I think that's what I meant, but I actually have no idea. <laughs> it was a note to myself that I was like, maybe Tom can help me understand this note I wrote myself. Right. A lot of these episodes are helping <laughs> helping to decode Jess's uh, aphorisms. Yes. So it's about next week, talk taking external stimuli and information and and processing it through comics yeah something. yeah and a balance also it seems like the stories that come outside the the stories that are coming from outside from the outside world uh help us to be less absorbed or less mm -hmm. eye centric which can be good for storytelling not always but usually pretty pretty cool keep us curious about the world and then also um the balance between that and then like knowing that the power to do that sort of storytelling or the storytelling that you want to do does come from within like the strength and the skills and the equipment that you have right now you like you're ready you can do it so i wanted to like kind of thread those two things to do but also talk about burnout if we could but i don't know i don't know if we'll get around to it we can connect. we can connect those dots okay jess thanks this was fun i um I want to I want to go draw like a minimal number of really supercharged narrative objects now. Yes. Yay. <laughs> narrative objects and narrative fences, right? But not everything. I'm really excited to. I need to believe in the chat. <laughs> I'm gonna draw some flames. Yeah, flames in the sky, and a giant. It's nice narrative. to talk about drawing with you. So, um, if I think of a better idea for the next episode, I might I might change my mind. Stay tuned next week when we talk about something else. <laughs> All right, Jess, I'll see you next week. Thanks, All everybody. Right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us. This has been a production of the Sequential Artists Workshop, or SAW. You can find us on social media at Comics Workshop and online at sawcomics.org. You can hear about our many courses at learn.sawcomics.org. SAW is a nonprofit and supported by people like you. Learn how to make a tax deductible donation at the donate page of sawcomics.org. You can join our free community of comics explorers at members.sawcomics.org. Thanks so much for being here.